Hi, welcome to Midwest Magic Cleaning. My name is Skull. And we just spent the entire week at the most interesting house that I've cleaned on the channel to date. Now, part of that is because of the backstory, but a larger part of it is because of all the cool stuff that we found. So the story of this place is that it was owned by, we'll call them mom and dad. Mom and dad are 79 years old, and the mom had a pretty major stroke and is now currently in a nursing home. The dad, even at 79, still works three jobs, and the house was built in the 1800s. It was an old farmhouse that's been renovated over the years, but a whole bunch of stuff is still original, including the nails that hold it together are those square type of nails that they used to hand forge. After the mom's stroke, the dad looked around and said, I can't do this anymore with this house, and he grabbed what he needed, a few things that he wanted, and he moved out, and the house has been unoccupied for at least a few years. Judging from the food I found in here, the newest food was about two two and a half years old. So anyway, the house was handed down to two sisters and they bought a dilapidated house next door. And the plans for this is to basically bulldoze it down and build a new home from scratch. There's really no save in this house. It doesn't have much historical significance. And it's just the, the cost of renovating this place far outweighs the cost of building a brand new home from scratch. So suck it. So before that can happen, that's like a long-term goal. So what my job is is to come in here and sort through everything, throw away the trash, find the valuable stuff, and get rid of everything that's not of value, either monetarily or sentimental, and then it's basically going to serve as a storage place until it can be rebuilt. Now to add to the complexity of this, there was at least one fire, and I believe there were actually two. One started from what appears to be a clogged furnace, and the other one was an electrical fire, and thank God it was actually stopped before it burned the house down, but even though there was no real fire damage, there was soot everywhere. The downside to all this is that there's no water and no heat. So we couldn't mop, we could only use just basic cleaning supplies to do really simplistic cleaning. But cleaning is not the goal for this house. The goal is to fill a dumpster with the crap and fill the house with the good stuff. Everything that's not sentimental is going to be sold off, which means that everything that's going into the, into the dumpster is actual trash. And also ghosts. We're throwing away all ghosts that we find. Suck it, ghosts. Please don't throw me in the trash. I am a useful ghost. Shut up, you going in the dumpster, stupid ghost face. Anyway, we're starting in a room that I call the office, even though it's not really an office. I'm just calling it an office because I saw a solitary desk in there, and my brain's fairly simple. There's actually a reason we're starting in this room, in that it is really, really empty. Everything that's in this room right Right now is pretty much useless and it's being used as a storage room already. So we're just going to move everything out of it, get it basically clean and then reutilize it as a full blown storage room. That's going to really help whenever we start cleaning the kitchen, the living room and the bedroom because we have to have room to move things out of those rooms and into another room. So anything that we move out can go directly in here. But before we can do that, we need it emptied and cleaned. Otherwise, we're just piling stuff on top of other stuff and that doesn't help anyone. Now, the thing that took the most time is that almost everything in this house had some sort of value. There were tons and tons of antiques, lots and lots of family heirlooms, 16 moose, just tons of stuff. And that brings me to the second part of why this house was so cool. We found at least 100, if not 200 photos from the 1800s, and some of them look like they stretch back to the Civil War era. We found high school graduation diplomas from 1921, silk handkerchiefs that were carried in proms and weddings dating clear back to 1903, an absolute ton of actual silverware, like silver silverware, a cassette tape of the sisters' first words from 1975, and of course, the largest Longa Burger collection I've ever seen. For those of you who don't know, uh, Longa Burger made baskets, dish sets, blankets, handbags, bags, and the people who collect those are rabid about their collections. A couple years ago, I had a video where I threw away two Longa Burger baskets that were broken, and people acted like I was throwing away children. 
living children coated in gold. Now, where I'm from in rural Illinois, Longer Burger baskets are a dime a dozen that you find them in most houses. But outside of Illinois, there are collectors who will pay big, big money for those. So we gathered them all up and then stored them in the storage room, which you'll see later on in the video. And then those are some of the things that the sisters will be selling off. Now, because there was so many collectible items and because there was so much old stuff in here, it meant that every box had to be combed through meticulously to make sure we weren't throwing away anything important. We seriously found two birth certificates, one death certificate, and their uncle's ashes. And no, that's not a joke. We like literally found his ashes in the in the bedroom. So absolutely nothing could just be grabbed in bulk and tossed. So you'll see me poking through a whole bunch of these boxes. And I opened up so many of them that made me say, holy crap, I was legitimately annoying myself. Whereas having to tell myself, all right, dude, we get it. It's a really, really old picture. But this is like the hundredth one you've seen in this house alone. But shut up, me. It's from the 1800s. Yeah, we know. You don't have to say holy crap every time. And by the way, where are your pants? Don't you worry your pretty little head about it, none me. You just go on about your business. So since there was no water, we couldn't mop or do a whole bunch of cleaning. But I did have Jason clean off a few things just to do it. So he used Mr. Clean on anything that was wood. And then we followed that up with Old English, which I use Old English or Liquid Gold. Both are really good, but Old English is a little bit shinier. And the difference it made on the desks and TV stands and dressers was pretty significant. But again, for the most part, we were just there to stack and sort. And this whole house from front to finish was like a treasure hunt. In fact, it was like a treasure hunt where you have to dig through other treasure to get to the bigger treasure that's buried in more treasure. It's like digging in a beach, except instead of sand, it's a beach made of treasure. Now I get asked all the time, how do I know where to put the stuff? And in a house like this, we create the areas that it goes into. So in other words, we'll consolidate. But since this house is being used as a storage place instead of a livable house, we can use every room to store stuff. However, I still like to keep purpose for every room. So the things that we're going to store in the bedroom are typically going to be stuff that would normally go into a bedroom. Since we're storing some furniture and dressers and whatnot in the office, we're going to keep to that general idea when we're storing things in there. Like the longer burger baskets will go in there, but so will all the desks, extra dressers, wood projects that are being worked on, and then like the heads of our fallen enemies. They can just sit in there and think about what they've done. Obviously, all kitchen stuff will go in the kitchen, but overall, we're going to consolidate things so that if they're looking for, let's say, pictures. We, we had, I think, five tubs of pictures by the time we were done. More pictures than I've ever seen in any house ever. But if they're looking for pictures, they can go to one tub, see that there's a picture on top of it, and know that every tub around there is filled with pictures. If they're looking for old board games, those will all be in one section. Before all the paperwork was scattered all around the house, now it's all in one single tub. And it's the same with old dishes and hand-me-downs. Sentimental items will have their own tub. And just by consolidating all those things into their own 
categories, it frees up space because they're no longer scattered, they're grouped together. So at any given time, we would have five tubs open ready to go so that if I found some books, it would go in the book tub. Trash will go in a trash tub to make it easier to carry to the dumpster. Clothing would go into another tub, that way we could bring it out to the sisters who were by the dumpster. They could root through it and then anything they wanted to keep, they could pull out. Anything they wanted to donate could be pulled out for that. Anything else could just be tossed. Now, if you're ever clearing out a house that is this cluttered, your first instinct may be to look around and say, man, this is going to take like 50 tubs to store all this stuff. What I suggest instead is starting out with five. That way you can start your categories and start consolidating. And what we've found is that as you start consolidating things from tubs that already exist, those tubs that they already own will then get emptied and be reusable. So we started out with five tubs and by the time we were done with the entire house we actually had eight tubs left over because we'd emptied so many of them out and consolidated so much stuff together it freed up all the other tubs that they already owned. So in the end we could have actually started out with no tubs whatsoever and still ended up with a surplus. But I think having those five initial ones especially like I said when you're dealing with a house that's got a lot of stuff it helps to have those initial five because then you can create five categories of the most numerous items in the room that you're cleaning and that gets the largest part of your mess out of the way and into a tub. Never try to put a ghost in a tub. Those go straight in the dumpster. Please don't put me in the dumpster. Shut up, ghost. Also, and this is really important, when you're cleaning out one room, don't be afraid to make another room messy. You have to move the stuff in the room that you're cleaning in order to clean it, in order to free up more space. And that means that naturally you're going to be putting that stuff in another room, which is going to make it look 10 times worse than it was. That's a part of the process. Your goal is to concentrate on one room at a time. So you're not cleaning the house, you're cleaning just this room. And in fact, the way I do it mentally is that I'm not cleaning that room. I'm cleaning this corner of this room. Nothing else matters. Just get the crap out of your way, move it wherever it can go so that you can concentrate on that one area that you're cleaning. That's the finish line, not the house. And the reason I tell you this is because we were moving a ton of this stuff into what I would consider to be the formal living room. And that room wasn't in bad shape until we moved a bunch of stuff into it. I just wanted to give you a heads up that it always looks worse before it looks better. And that's fine. That's a part of the process. Don't let that overwhelm you. By the way, all that stuff on the floor, that's all soot. So this is the room where one of the fires happened and Jason actually found the source of it. It was an old power strip that had been overloaded. So all of the outlets on the face of that power strip were all electrically fried. They were all scorch marked. Where it was plugged into the wall was also scorch marked. And that's the scary part is that it was still plugged into the wall. But I thought all that stuff on the floor was spray paint until Jason pointed out that as we were walking on it, you could see our footprints. Then we noticed the soot was on some of the furniture that we were moving. It was lightly coating the walls. And that's when we realized that basically the whole room was covered in a very fine misted gray. Shockingly, nothing was really damaged beyond repair. It just needed cleaned up. As far as like the stuff she's going to sell online, none of it's damaged. It's just kind of soot stained and it wipes right off with a rag, but it could have been a lot worse. It had it gotten out of control, it could have burned the whole house down. I opened every drawer of every desk that existed in this house because they had several junk drawers, but inside those junk drawers, I found at least five or six things that were really important. Jason found an envelope full of rare pennies. I found everything from antique pocket knives to jewelry to pictures from the 1800s. Like, I don't think most people would think to look inside of the TV stands because you're just going to find, at best, some DVDs and VHS tapes. But in this one, we found a home movie camera from the 1980s right alongside dozens and 
and dozens of tapes. So it's likely that those are all home movies of like their kids and stuff when they were growing up. So yeah, everything gets sorted through so that nothing gets overlooked. You'll find the most special things in the weirdest places in a house like this. I mean, right here on this channel in one of my old videos, I found the deed to 24 acres of land just sitting in a box of junk mail. If we did what some other cleaning channels did, which is just grab the box of junk and throw it away or shovel everything up into a pile, we would have lost that or in the case of this house, two birth certificates. So even in a case if, where the owner says everything can go, just chuck it all, that's never really the case. Let me apologize right off the bat for the camera angle in this next room. This is the bedroom. If you ever see one of my videos where the camera is hugging right up on me and it looks like you're just way in the trenches in one of these rooms, it's because there's so much stuff in the room you can't find a place to put the camera. So I put the camera in the only place I could find and really I had to make room for that. And then I had to work right in front of it in order to clear out enough space for us to walk around. Then I can back the camera off a little bit and work away from it so you can see better what I'm doing. But this was one of those rooms that had so much clutter in it that the goal, the immediate goal, wasn't just to pick up things and put them where they go. It wasn't to throw away trash. It was to clear enough space that we could walk without hurting ourselves. I mean, I've been walking for half a century and I still trip over stuff in rooms like this. Oh, speaking of which, the floors in the bathroom, utility room, and this bedroom were so shot, the subfloors, they were so shot and so 
rotted out that they bowed like a bowl. They were super soft. They tried to alleviate the problem by putting plywood down in certain areas so they wouldn't fall through the floor. But it was bad enough that you could feel that even the joists underneath it had rotted as well. I don't think I got a shot of the ceiling and hopefully I did in one of the before and after shots, but a very large part of the ceiling had fallen off because it was one of those tongue and key plaster jobs from way, way, way long ago, like more than four years ago. That's how long ago it was. But if you're wondering when you see the dresser, what all that crap is on top of it, that's where the ceiling fell in. A chunk of the ceiling about three to four feet wide had fallen off and it was such thick, durable plaster that it didn't break whenever it hit the ground. You'll see that whenever I'm cleaning the dresser, it's off on the right hand side. It's this massive piece of plaster. But yeah, mainly on this room, it was the same exact method as the last room. It's all consolidation and sorting, but there was something that made this one just a bit easier. Their rules were all the dad's clothes needed to stay because he wanted to go through them. All the mom's clothes could go because now that she's at the nursing home, she no longer needs those. And if she needs new clothes, they can just buy them for her. So it was all women's clothing, all shoes could be tossed, all men's clothing, just put it away so he can go through those later. There's also a really interesting thing about this house. I saw no bugs, not one piece of mouse poop anywhere, which I think this would be the very first house that didn't have those things in it, at least the ones on the channel that you've seen. The only thing that I found was in the office, they had woodworms. And those were fairly creepy and bleh. And really, they'll have to have that taken care of if the house isn't going to be bulldozed for a few years, because if it's not taken care of, they'll eventually get out into the main part of the house and they'll eat all that furniture. I offered to spin kick the woodworms because that would destroy them all in one shot, but it also runs the risk of making the house collapse just from the force of my spin and also kick. So for the sake of having the house still be utilized for storage, we opted to not go the spin kick method. Also, weird side note, I found like 30 copies of a book called Holly Bibble. I hadn't heard of it before, so I kind of flipped through it and it looks like it was about a character called Jesus Christ, like Spanish or Mexican or something. But I, I don't know why you'd need that many copies of a single book, but they really love that thing, which I guess I kind of get. I'm a huge fan of The Lonely Island and I own 32 copies of the movie Hot Rod, you know, just in case. So while you're watching this clean in real time here, let's talk about some news. So in the middle of this, Jason had a family emergency and I'm not going to go into detail because it's like a medical thing and that's their private stuff. Everything's fine, but it was enough to give them a scare. They needed to go to the ER and stuff like that. So you'll see me cleaning a little bit later with uh, my friend Michelle. She came out and helped me out while Jason was gone. We have a few more houses lined up. Now one I'm breaking my rule on. Normally I try to do these houses within a 30 mile area of where I live. It's a 
logistics thing. If I go further than that, I've got to get a hotel. Then food starts racking up because you got to eat out all the time. Then you add in eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars for a dumpster, and before you know it, you spent two to three thousand dollars for a week long trip to some town you'd never been to before. However, someone got a hold of me about two and a half hours from my hometown, and she sent me pictures, and she is in very desperate need. So I'm currently working on setting up something, hopefully for next week for her. And I hope we can make it work because her house is on par with some of the worst you've seen on the channel. So I really want to go down there and help her like dig out of that hole and get her life back to normal because you can tell just looking at the pictures that she is living in hell right now. I would like to get her out of that. There's another one that's way further north than that, but that's like four plus hours away. And I desperately want to do that one because the house is empty. Well, not empty. It's completely hoarded, but the people who live there had passed away and they're just wanting somebody to come go in there and just go ham on it. And that's what I'm good at. But I don't know if I can make that work or not. I'm still kind of trying to work out the details. Again, it's expensive. I have another house that's local that is in kind of the same situation as the first lady's house. And she is getting ready to finally admit there's a problem and is possibly going to have me go in there and just tornado my way through the house and, and get everything clean up, but that one is still, I don't want to push her into something until she's absolutely ready to do it. But I guess the point of all those three is that we do have more houses that require actual cleaning on the burners. So I think we're about ready to jump back into the old school type of videos for those of you who have been around for a while where I go in and the house is hoarded and it needs not just trash all the way, but some severe cleaning. In other news, I won't advertise these again because I advertised them last week, but we've got new t-shirts in the merch shop. The link to the merch shop is in the description of this video. And I say t-shirts, but it's t-shirts, coffee mugs, mouse pads, like all, all the stuff you'd expect from a merch shop. And more importantly, on my end, we are getting ready to cross 460,000 subscribers. We are edging up closer and closer to that half a million subscriber milestone. And that's crazy and awesome. And if you haven't subscribed, that's the fastest, easiest, cheapest way to help out the channel because it's free. Every Every person who subscribes makes it easier and easier for us to go do these cleanups without having to worry about going into the hole financially. We're able to do these houses because we make money on YouTube. And also because I sell kidneys on the black market, son. I mean, I don't do that. I don't sell kidneys on the black market. That would be illegal. But yeah, subscribing is key. It is the, the simplest math in the world. The more people we have subscribed to the channel, the more we can help people out because the more money we have to put into those houses. And I'll say this again because I pretty much have to say it every week to people on Facebook. If you don't know which Facebook account is real and which ones are fake thieves, my real Facebook account is linked in the description of this video. Just open up the description, click on that. It'll take you right to my Facebook page and that's the real one. I only have one Facebook page. So if you're not on that one, you are on somebody's page who's stealing my work and pretending to be me. And in a final point of news, there will be an additional video this Monday. It's a short and sweet video, but I wanted to put it out. So just be prepared that there will be an extra one for everybody this Monday. So suck it. And as always, we have a members section. There are three tiers to that. The first tier gets access to Discord. The second tier gets access to Discord and they get an additional video every Wednesday. And then there's a third tier that we just won't talk about. If you can't afford to do things like that, please, for the love of God, do not become a member. It's an extra thing that people use to help financially support the channel. Both Jason and I are doing just fine. We can continue doing the work that we do without any problem. It's just a way to show a little bit of extra support. But I absolutely do not want people becoming members who can't afford it, who are behind on bills, who are having any sort of financial problems. I see all of your comments. I know that you love the channel. There is no need to become a member in hopes that I see your name harder than I normally see see it. Membership or no membership, we're all still a part of the same weird cleaning cult. It's just that the members are forced to get weird haircuts and wear strange robes. One thing I found really interesting in this house was that they had a lot of wood furniture and almost every one of them had the drawers fused shut because of the humidity in the house over the years. From the wood swelling and contracting over and over and over, the drawers just got to the point where they're so tight you can't open them without a crowbar. And also if you're wondering why I'm wearing a jacket through most of this. It was
was fairly cold where I live and this house had no heat. So most of the time we were working in say 40 degrees and even if it warmed up outside, the house still retained the coldness. So even whenever it got up to 70 the other day, the house was still only in the low 50s, high 40s. Yep. Oh, Woo. <laughs> Oh, man, Ooh, the look on your face yeah. says it all right there. That's probably it. And if you're wondering why I'm wearing LeBrons in part of this cleanup, it's because that's how I roll, son. I'll clean in Jordans, LeBrons. Hell, I'll clean in Luke Longley's. I don't even care. I'm crazy, son. I found out late in life that I'm a shoe guy. I can't help it. Big important thing on a clean out like this, if you're cleaning a room that has a carpet and it's covered in clutter, when you're done, before you run your vacuum, pick up as much of the debris by hand as you can. Because if you run your vacuum over really bad clutter like that, you're gonna kill your vacuum. So I don't let mine pick up things like plaster shards, nails, tacks. If you got a crafter in the house, there's a good chance there's that little green stringy fake Easter basket grass or yarn or thread. I make sure I pick up most of that by hand before I ever run a vacuum. Now you can get a carpet rake which kind of helps too but I already bring enough crap to a cleaning. My car is already full of implements of cleaning destruction so I don't have room to add even more stuff to it. So for instance a lot of people will ask me why don't you just get like a 55 gallon drum and then put the trash bag in there so you don't have to hold it while you're picking up trash. And it's like I have no room to have a 55 gallon drum. I would have to have a truck which I don't have though I could I I guess I could just strap it to the top of my car like the Beverly Hillbillies or something. But yeah, I'm, I'm completely stocked on cleaning stuff. It's not a big deal to pick it up by hand, though I know half of you are yelling at me because I'm doing that without gloves. So to answer that question, why am I not wearing gloves through this? It's because I'm autistic and gloves freak me out a little bit. So I only wear them if I'm dealing with a biohazard or stuff that's just super gross. You may be surprised that there's a whole lot of housekeepers out there who don't use gloves. Yes, we all know that that's not smart. It's not a good idea to clean without them, but it also gets kind of difficult to pick up small things when you got your hands covered. If you know what I mean, ha <laughs> ha I don't actually know what I mean there. But yeah, Jason's smart. He wears them all the time. I just, it takes a lot for me to put them on. So if you see me wearing a mask and you see me wearing gloves in a video, you know it's especially bad.
Let's head into the kitchen. Uh, these shots are extremely tight because this is not really a kitchen. It's a sink and a stove that's set about three feet apart. It is the tiniest, most cramped little nook that I've ever seen in a house. And that's really what it is, it's just a nook. So I crammed a camera in there and I'm trying to get what I can on film, but I'm not really doing anything crazy with these cabinets. All those are longer burger dishes in there, so I'm just restacking them so they're all together. And then I'm taking out any of the dime a dozen type dishes and tossing them. But for the most part, I'm just restacking the stuff that is a legitimate set that has some value and getting rid of the trash. In other cabinets, I did the same thing, but even though the things that I kept may not have value, they may have functional value to the family. So for instance, vegetable choppers or mixers and blenders, whatnot. But I put them in there in a way and rearranged them and organized them so that when the family looks in there to see what they want and what they want to throw away, it's all right there within reach. They can tell at a glance what's what's in each of these cabinets. The only one that I took some major time in doing is above the sink, there is a cabinet full of medicine and I put all those in a single Tupperware type of box. And then we took those to the pharmacy to get those properly disposed of. You don't want to throw those in a dumpster or in the trash. Pharmacies have an actual way to dispose of them. So we just brought them all there. It's usually not a cost to do that either. Maybe in a bigger city, they may charge you, but in a town like mine, it's usually just free. And then there was a junk drawer. I basically pulled out all the tools, anything that has some sort of functional use, anything that has value. I think I found a couple of old, um, they call them old timer knives that has some value. And then once I've sifted through all that, the rest of it goes right in the trash. Now, some things have functional value, but I got rid of them anyway. For instance, there were a couple pairs of scissors. I got rid of those because there's 30 other pairs of scissors already in the house. There's no need to just keep adding to that pile. They were also old enough to where they couldn't really be donated to schools because they had rust on them or they were dull or they were just plain smart asses. I don't donate anything that's got an attitude because then you're just passing along the attitude to the school and it's just an ordeal. It's better that they just go straight to the dumpster with the ghosts. Please get me out of the dumpster. Shut up, you stupid ghost. We found a couple of interesting things. We have what they call love cups. They're goblets. Uh, from around 1837 and those were typically given at uh, births around my area. So somebody would have a baby you give them something that was like silver or silver plated. Uh, the one that we could verify the year on was 1837. We found actual silverware, bags of it that had been handed down through the generations and we also found several pieces of pottery that were signed by different people but had the same exact design on them and we believe that comes from a college in Illinois. It's a women's college that um, specialized in pottery. And if it is from that, then it, it has some like legitimate huge value to it. So we kept everything that had a signature. In fact, we kept everything that didn't have a signature too because they have so much old stuff in the house that even if it doesn't have a signature, it, there's a good chance that it's collectible pottery. This woman did not mess around with her collections at all. She collected good stuff for a reason and she knew exactly what she was looking for. Also, the young lady in the show is Michelle. She's been a friend of mine for a really long time. And of course, because the, the camera's set up the way it is, it's basically, you can see Michelle's torso. So everyone say hi to Michelle's torso. But she's super cool and super funny and super dark and super weird in all the right ways. And hopefully you'll see more of her on the channel, Hit and Miss. She really likes doing this type of stuff. So I gave her an open invite. Anytime she wants to come help, she's more than welcome to come sort through people's houses with me and throw things in the dumpster angrily. <laughs> also, she found out the hard way what a lot of people find out when they help me. So if I'm ever in your town and you want to help me and I say yes, understand there's a whole lot of um, just waiting for me to give directions. <laughs> It'll be like me looking at a room for a bit and trying to solve it like a puzzle and then I'll start grabbing things and it'll basically just be, okay, let's put this in this room. I have a tub for this. Here's where that tub's located. Let's put that in there. But it's a lot of standing around and watching me think. So I know Michelle was getting a bit antsy thinking, is there anything that I can do that doesn't require you to tell me to do this or this? But really on videos, I've got a process by which I kind of adhere to. And it can be annoying for people who want to jump in and just go balls to the wall. Also, I take frequent breaks. I practice what I preach. I say that on the channel a lot for people to take breaks. Sometimes I'll work 10 or 
15 minutes and then take a break. Sometimes I'll work an hour, then take a break. But typically, as a general rule of thumb, I'll go about 20 minutes and then take a five or 10 minute break, then another 20, then five or 10 minutes. That's not necessary on a regular everyday clean, like if you're just cleaning your house. But when you're doing something that's this cluttered and this chaotic, you have to do it in order to give yourself a mental and a physical break. What I found is that 20 minutes is just long enough to where you're not getting yourself exhausted and five or 10 minute break is just short enough to where you don't get locked into your chair. It's all about managing your physical and mental energy. And I just found that the 2010 rule works for me. Barbie from Clean with Barbie and Bonnie from A Beautiful Mess, they work balls to the wall nonstop. And that works for them. That's great. It just doesn't quite work for me. I have to take frequent breaks. Once we got all the clutter sorted and all the trash thrown away, the kitchen was pretty easy. It was just making sure that all the dishes were in basically the same area. And then there were a couple of cabinets that needed sorted as well. And I really would have liked to have cleaned this whole room. And had Jason been here, I would have had him do it while I worked on the actual organization part. But again, nobody's living here. It would have just been a nice extra to do for them. But to wrap up the kitchen, we're just going to kind of organize and make everything symmetrical. Make sure everything's consolidated into the right areas so that they're easy to find. And more importantly, that they're easy to explain to the people who own the house because I'll walk through the house with them after it's all done. I'll say, here's where I put this. Here's where I put this groups of stuff. If you're looking for this type of thing, it's going to be in this type of area. And I explain all that front to finish. And then I, I make sure that they have a way to contact me. So in case they need to ask where something is, I can typically remember where almost everything is in almost every house that I've cleaned so far. It's kind of like if you're an artist and you've uh, drawn or painted a lot, you can look at one of the pieces that you've done and say, oh yeah, I remember drawing that. I remember I had trouble on this eye or I had trouble on this moose antler. I think kind of the same thing with houses. I'll think of the house that I've worked on and I'll, I'll be able to remember, yeah, I remember putting all of these antiques in this area. It's, it's kind of the same thing. It just sticks in my brain. But the thing is, I need it to stick in the owner's brains so that they, I'm just not hiding all their stuff from them. Hey, where did you put my uncle's ashes? Yeah, wouldn't you like to know? Another question I get a lot is, do you ever find money? I do. It's mostly in the form of change, but I have found bigger bills before. Whenever I find money, I always put it together. So I'll find a jar or a bag or something and put all the money in that. Then I'll set it in a special place. And then that's the first thing I tell the owner where it's located. And I guess in this one, while I was working on this house, one of the sisters was working on, I think her grandmother's house or something, and they found a bunch of 
of Confederate money that was in mint condition. I've never found anything like that, but I mean, that's a weird find. Another question I get asked a lot is kind of a weird one, and it's, have you ever encountered something supernatural or spooky or unexplainable in a house that you've cleaned? I have not. However, there was one house I was going to clean as a part of my business, and for some reason or another, every bad thing that could possibly happen happened while I was at that house. Just accidents and things falling over and me hurting myself. It seemed like every hour something really bad happened at that house. And I was kind of glad when she decided that she didn't actually want a housekeeper because she was going to hire me. I actually went over there just to help her out with another project. Then once that project was done, I asked her about the housekeeping thing. And she was like, I think I'm going to hold off for now. It's not really in my budget. And I actually felt relieved whenever she told me that. I don't really believe in supernatural type of stuff, but that house, if there was anything supernatural that existed, it existed in that house. And also, it turned out that woman was a ghost the whole time. And she's now in the dumpster. Please let me out of the dumpster. You gonna be talking to my foot, ghost? The very last room that I worked on was the living room. I had Michelle for the first part of that, but then I had to come back the next day and finish up on my own. So while she was there, I had her help me carry all the heavy furniture into the storage room. Then the next day when I came back, I could just put things away, sweep the floor down, consolidate more items, collect all the long burger. There was still a bunch more dishes that I found that needed to be put away. Lots of empty boxes. But yeah, it was all just kind of a smattering of stuff that belonged in other rooms. So so I just had to pick it up and put it there. I believe this floor in this room was original to the house when it was first built from like the 1800s. I don't know if anybody would find that interesting or not, but I just think it's cool because it's 200 year old floors. I know that in Europe, they're used to having things way, way, way older than that. So 200 year anything doesn't sound that old to them. But I mean, if you think about it from an American's perspective, we only became a country like 250 years ago. So finding a house that's almost as old as your actual country 
country that's kind of crazy for us. Anyway, you'll also notice an exercise bike, which I think also came from the 1800s because it was about 250 pounds. I don't actually refer to those as exercise bikes. I refer to those as optimism or good intentions. Almost every house I go to to clean has one and every single instance they all look brand new because people get them with the best of intentions. They use them for a bit, they realize they suck, then they get off and never get back on them again in general. And then nobody wants them so you can't give them away. Definitely no one's buying them. You see advertisements for them all the time on Facebook that'll say like new exercise bike $150 and it will stay there forever because the truth is everybody has a like new exercise bike around here. Hey, before I wrap this up and let you all go, I'd like to ask you something as an experiment. In the two years that the channel's been around, I've, I've cleaned like 200 houses, something like that. I know I've done over 200 videos. I don't think I've ever once asked anybody to hit the like button. I don't know if it's important. I hear people asking about it on every video to do the whole like, comment, subscribe, share thing. I think that, it, that people ask it so much that it's become just background noise. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's just the way you end a YouTube video. So for the first time ever, I would like to ask you to hit the like button on this video. Let's see if it actually makes a difference or does anything. Maybe if enough people do it, it'll like summon a moose ghost or something. I don't know. Anyway, I, um, if you would hit the, the like button, we'll see what it does. Anyway, thanks for watching. Members, I'll see you this Wednesday. Everyone else, I'll see, I normally say I'll see you next weekend, but I'll see you this Monday because I'll have a special video out on Monday. And then I'll see you again the, the next weekend. And if you're a moose, I'll see you in hell. Later.